wish I could show you. Maybe I should show you.
to be a chair upside down. Many of us have lost loved ones. Many of us have lost our jobs. Many of us are struggling. You say, what do you want? If you raise your hand, if you want prayer. If you want prayer right now.
Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. I must say, just having a look at you with your masks on, it's a great improvement from what was before. <laughs> I think I like this look better. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Kevin and the team for leading us so beautifully, so powerfully this morning. I just really sense the presence of God with us in this place today. A huge welcome to those joining us online on the Facebook platform. Uh, for those who don't know, there were about 1,500 plus people who joined us uh, by technology last Sunday. So besides us meeting here together, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of others that are part of the service today from all over the world. I know Australia, New Zealand, England, America, all represented. So in a sense, we're part of a global family today. What an absolute pleasure. 
Well, friends, if you've got your Bibles, let's get stuck in again to our new series called A Spirit Empowered People. We're in the book of Acts. And um, in many ways, we're going back to our roots. As I said last week, we retrace the history going back 2,000 years ago to where the church began in the city of Jerusalem all those years ago. Last week, we considered the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Where he said, Would John baptize with water? Many of you have been baptized in water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Those were the words of Jesus. Clearly, Jesus was quoting the words of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, where John said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So just as John immersed you with water, Jesus said, I'm going to immerse you, I'm going to, I'm going to cover you, I'm going to drench you, so to speak, with a different power, the power of the Holy Spirit. So today we're in Acts chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. And this is the great day when those prophetic words became a reality. When the ascended Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, poured out his promised Holy Spirit upon the early church and empowered them with dunamis, with dynamite power, great power, to advance the kingdom of God around the known world. Let's read the story together in Acts chapter 2. I told you last week these words were written by Luke. Luke, of course, was one of the disciples and a medical doctor. And this is his observation of the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance now they were dwelling in jerusalem jews devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Well, what I want us to do today is to try and answer that question that was posed by those observers on the day of Pentecost. Whatever does this mean? What were some of the evidences, or some of the characteristics of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on that day 2,000 years ago, and how does that relate to us as Christ followers today living in 2020? Well, number one, we see that this was clearly an external power, characterized by what Luke describes as a powerful wind and tongues of fire. Verse 2, this is recap, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, 
and one sat upon each of them. Wind and fire were part of this first Pentecost experience. Let's begin with wind. Because living in Ganubi, we are well acquainted with the wind. Fortunately today, it's a beautiful, peaceful, calm day. But often we can have a howling west wind, a howling east wind. We know exactly what strong wind feels like. Now these first 120 believers gathered together in Jerusalem experienced what Luke describes as like a powerful wind. He doesn't say it was a powerful wind, but it was something that can be compared to a powerful, powerful rushing wind coming from the outside of them. This was clearly not something natural. This was something supernatural because Luke puts it in verse 2 that this wind came from heaven. This was not something they experienced before in a natural capacity. These ordinary men and women experienced something external, something heavenly, a heavenly power invading and filling their bodies. Now just that thought puts us on a collision course with modern day culture which teaches that primarily our problems are external and inside of us we've got the wherewithal we've got what it takes to solve them your problems are circumstantial your problems are related to other people maybe the government is the problem whoever you might want to blame and inside of you you've got what it takes to deal with these different situations. Christianity says something completely different. The Bible says our main problem is internal. It's inside of us. In essence, we are the problem. And God has made His power available to us to empower us to change. You get it? The world says the problem is out there, Solution in here. The Bible says, no, no, no. The problem's in here. And the solution is the power of God that He makes available to us. Well known psychotherapist often appears on CNN and these big networks. Laurie Gottlieb says this. She says, I see fewer and fewer people in her practice coming in and saying, I want to change. No, rather they want something else or someone else to change. Friends, how frustrating if all your problems are other people related, are circumstantial, because that means you've got no control over your life. Your level of joy and peace is controlled and determined by other things which are totally unpredictable. How frustrating. To live a life like that. Living at the womb of circumstance. No. But if the problem, if the Bible's correct and the problem is primarily internal, in other words, you are the problem, well then there's tremendous hope. Because God has made a solution available. Some dunamos, some great Holy Spirit power that can invade your life. And transform you from the inside out. Amen. Well, what about the fire? You know about the wind, but what about the fire? That word fire throughout the course of the Bible is so, so significant. In the Old Testament, when God's glory, when God's special presence showed up, it often showed up as fire. Let me give you a couple of examples, but you can do some more research on your own. Genesis chapter 15, way back in the beginning of the Bible, when making a covenant with Abraham, God appears to Abraham as a burning torch. Exodus chapter 3, God appears to Moses in a burning bush. The bush is on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. Exodus chapter 13, Leading the Israelites through the wilderness. God appears at night as a pillar of fire. Exodus chapter 19. When God appears to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. He comes down in smoke and 
fire, and so the list goes on. But now in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, every believer, every Christ follower, is in a sense a burning bush. Because the glory of God, the Bible says, the presence of God, the very power of God, now resides within your mortal body. Romans 8 verse 11. You are custodians. You are carriers today of the fire of God, the power of God on the inside of you. And one of the first evidences of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life is a deep assurance in your spirit, man. We sung it earlier. That I am a child of God. You know it because you know it because you know it. You are absolutely secure in your identity as a son or a daughter of the living God. The Holy Spirit has made that real to you. Luke chapter 3. At the baptism of Jesus. Listen to what happened. It came to pass that Jesus was baptized in water. And while he prayed, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Jesus hadn't preached one sermon. Jesus hadn't performed one miracle. But the voice of the Father affirms his identity. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. You say, well, that's great. That's Jesus. What about me? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans 8, verse 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Kevin led us in the song today. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. No longer slaves to fear, but sons and daughters of the living God. The Holy Spirit makes that truth real in your life. Galatians 4 verse 6. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. You know, the best illustration I ever heard um, relating to this truth was told by my spiritual mentor, a man by the name of Peter Holness, many years ago. And he tried to bring this truth alive for us as young people many years ago. This is how he put it. He said, he related the story of a 17th century pastor by the name of Thomas Goodwin. And one day Thomas Goodwin was observing and he saw a father and his young son, primary school age, walking together down the road, having a conversation, just enjoying father and son time together, having a walk along the road. There came a point where the father stopped, he bent down, and he swept up his boy in his arms, he embraced him, he loved him, and he spoke words of affirmation to him. He then put him back on the ground, and they continued walking along together. Thomas Goodwin says, Was that little boy more of a son in his father's arms than he was walking on the road next to his dad? Legally, no. He was just as much a son on the road as he was in the farmer's arms. But experientially, oh, oh, when dad lifted him up, when dad embraced him, when dad spoke those words, you are my boy, he experienced unconditional love. He experienced affirmation. He experienced his sonship on a whole new level. Friends, I want to tell you today, with the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, a, is an experience in your life. It's not just intellectual or theological knowledge of God's love for you. Man, this becomes a deep, abiding truth in your spirit, man. That nothing in all of creation, heart nor depth, nothing can separate you from the love of God.
that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know it because you know it and because you know it. The Holy Spirit has cemented that truth deep in your spirit, man. Well, the third unusual manifestation on that first Pentecost day was found there in verse 4 of Acts chapter 2. We've spoken about the wind, we've spoken about the fire, but verse 4, and they were all filled, filled to key word, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is truly miraculous. As a missionary, this just brings joy to my heart. This was exactly 50 days after the Passover had occurred. So Jewish people had come from all over the known world. I read the list of countries to you earlier. They come from all over the known world to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And suddenly all these different nationalities, so to speak, are hearing the good news about Jesus in their own languages from people who had never been taught those languages. Have a look at verse 6. Everyone heard them speak in his own language. Verse 11. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, our own languages, the wonderful works of God. That word wonderful is the Greek word uh, megaleos, which means the mighty works of God. And so these early disciples were, were speaking the mighty works of God, were speaking about Jesus in languages they'd never previously before been exposed to. And suddenly these hearers, having received the gospel, you can imagine, would go back to all these different nations, in a sense as missionaries, carrying the message of hope all over the known world. Isn't that amazing? Just let that sink in for a minute this morning. Acts 1 verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Friends, God has no favorites. No language, no color, no creed, no nation has preference over another. Jesus Christ is an international, global, cross-cultural Savior. And even today, He's calling the world to follow Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. People speaking languages, not mumble-jumble, proper existing languages that they've never heard, never learned before. Exposing the known world to the love and grace of God. This is God's miraculous desire. In verse 14 now, Peter wants to give an explanation. He wants to give an interpretation of what's going on. Because some of the observers look at this and say, well, these guys are full of new wine. They've been starting too early in the morning. In fact, look what he says there in verse 13. Others mocking, he said, they are full of new wine. Here comes Peter's explanation. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Listen to my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour, nine o'clock in the morning. Obviously, Peter hasn't been to the lately. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously Jerusalem was a little bit above. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Man, this is riveting. The Old Testament is a long, long um, piece of literature containing many books. Which part of the Old Testament does Peter choose to use to explain Pentecost? He goes to Joel. A prophet who wrote these words hundreds of years before the day, and he says, It shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
on my men servants, on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Peter's making the point that what is happening in Jerusalem is the fulfillment of this prophetic word written by Joel hundreds of years before. Men and women being empowered by the Holy Spirit to declare, to prophesy the mighty works of God. I love the way John Piper, who is one of my theological heroes and a Baptist pastor in America, this is how he puts it. John Piper says the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when a person who is already a believer receives extraordinary spiritual power for Christ's exalting ministry. I can't put it better than that. <laughs> and you know what? Piper's right. Because every single time you read of somebody in the book of Acts being filled with the Spirit or being full of the Holy Spirit, it's directly connected to kingdom advancing ministry every single time. Let me give you a couple of examples before we pray. Acts chapter 4 verse 8. You try and pick up a trend as I read these verses to you. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, elders of Israel, and Peter goes on to preach a powerful sermon. Verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived these are uneducated, untrained men. They marveled what was going through their minds. How does this ordinary fisherman who a couple of weeks before was denying Jesus Christ around the campfire, I don't know him. What can account for such a radical transformation that this failed fisherman is now preaching powerfully to important people? Holy Spirit. Nothing else can account for that. Acts 4, 31. When they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. Here it comes again. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke, prophesied, spoke the word of God with boldness. Acts chapter 6. You can make this my last example, but you can pick up many more through the book of Acts. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. In fact, if you read on, it says his face even glowed like that of an angel. When people looked at him, there was a visible glow in his face. Well, in chapter 7, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, is martyred, is executed for his faith in Jesus. He lived in the power of the Spirit. He died. In the power of the Spirit. And friends, you can go on and on throughout the book of Acts. Men and women empowered by the Holy Spirit for kingdom advancing, Jesus glorifying ministry. So, what about us? Well, we, as Kevin said earlier, are living in challenging days. But also days of tremendous opportunity. Friends, last week we heard we have the mandate from the head of the church. Remember we gave Jesus that blank piece of paper last week. The mandate from our CEO, so to speak, is to leave this building and to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We have the mandate. We have the commission. But now we've got the power to get the job done until Jesus returns. The extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit has been made available to you to accomplish the mission of Jesus. But friends, those two go together. You cannot separate the mandate from the power. The two are inseparable. The power is not there to give you goosebumps. 
to make you feel good about yourself. It's there to empower you, like it empowered these people, to advance the kingdom of God all around the world and to bring glory to Jesus. The mandate and the power. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, to a broken, dying, sinful world, as the Father sent me as a missionary, so send I you. And with that he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. The mandate and the power are inseparable. So what I want us to do now is I want to give you an opportunity to think and to pray. You don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're not going to embrace the mission of Jesus. It's not designed for that. But today, if you say, Lord, in my circle of influence, amongst my family, my friends, my neighborhood, my office at the, at the, at the workplace, my school, I want to represent you well. I want to advance your kingdom in the area that you placed me. And Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to get the job done. All you need to do is ask God for that. So let's do it. And as we do that, I'm going to ask the sound desk just to play gently in the background a song and just to give us an opportunity. So Holy Spirit, <coughs> Ephesians 5, 18, do not be drunk on wine which leads to a wasted life, debauchery, but instead be full with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need to be full with the Holy Spirit because I choose to embrace the mission of Jesus. You just pretend there's no one else around you, just you and God, your business together. And I pray for us to be.
Just encourage your friends right there where you are. Just consider the mission of Jesus. The call of God upon our lives to go as ambassadors into all the world. God's going to roll for you. For those watching on live stream in the UK, New Zealand, America, all around the world, God's going to plan for you. God's going to call for you to make a difference in your part of the world. Open up your hearts, dear friends. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me, please, to overflowing. Rivers of living water to empower me in a way I've never been empowered before, to advance the kingdom of God, to glorify the name of Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Father, I pray you seal this moment in our lives. And this be a defining moment for many people today, Lord, as they, maybe for the first time in their lives, responded to the call of God to go as a kingdom advancing, Jesus glorifying Christian. Go into all the world, taking the mandate of Jesus, full, empowered, equipped by the dunamis. Great power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. We commit ourselves into your hands. For those who are struggling, for those who are battling, I pray for encouragement. Pray for your love to surround them. Father, may we live this week for the glory of your name and for the extension of your kingdom in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' great name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone.